disconnect with Wi-Fi and all of a sudden your phone doesn't work. Now you realize, hey, oh, I, I think I've been SIM swapped. You call the co your, your phone company, but the damage is done because on the hacker side, what happened is the second they were successful at swapping that number over to that device, they have a team of people who are ready, ready and waiting. They're logging into your Facebook. They're going into your Gmail. They're contacting your family, telling your family that, hey, I'm in the bind. I need Bitcoin. I, you know, send it to this address. They're going out on all fronts all at once, changing passwords. It's all of a sudden it's this panic where you've got to go and try and reset passwords, lock things off, get your SIM back from the phone company. And the results are devastating. Bing bong. I am back with another edition of the State of Bitcoin podcast where I've got Jeremy Hill and Jonathan of Cloaked Wireless who are going to tell us about the potential next biggest attack on Bitcoin. Not on Bitcoin the network, not on Bitcoin or anything else related to that, but on you, the users. If you have a smartphone like this right here, an iPhone or an Android or something else, you have the potential to get SIM swap. We've already seen it with big name people in the industry with George Gammon, Jeff Booth, Mark Moss, Preston Pitts, all have been SIM swapped and have had their social medias compromised because of it. So, boys, I want to start it right off the bat. Do you think SIM swapping could be the potential attack, not on Bitcoin the network, but on the next attack on Bitcoin the users, whether it's you know, SIM swapping to steal some private keys or SIM swapping to steal some lightning wallets or anything like that. Do you see it as a big issue here going forward, especially in this next bull run that we've got? Yeah, 100%. And uh, yeah, I mean, I think, I think one of the biggest issues that we're oh, sorry, go ahead, Jonathan. Go ahead. Um, as we see um, the prices go up, uh, we absolutely see it, more people becoming, becoming targets. Uh, it's just a natural course of things. Um, the amount of money being available uh, increases the uh, amount of money people are willing to spend on attacks. Um, we've seen um, uh, certain groups like Lapsus willing to spend $20,000 a week for an, a single individual to uh, perform the SIM swaps uh, for um, any insider who works at these companies. Yeah, I mean, it's a massive problem because I think obviously the, the Bitcoin community has been targeted because, you know, here's a group of people who are very public, very, very outspoken online and social media who, who clearly have um, Bitcoin and even in, 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 in you know, the altcoin world as well. Um, and, and we've seen these people be targeted over and over again. Uh, by these sim swap uh, hackers, um, you know the FTX. There was like four hundred million dollars went missing uh, from from FTX. It was a result of a sim swap attack. Uh, and I think people just don't realize how vulnerable uh, they are. You know, and, and you can say there's this. I I self custody. You know, I don't keep I don't keep anything on exchanges. Um, but the reality is that I think most people would be astonished with how many platforms and technologies they use today that still rely on SMS or voice based two-factor authentication. And, and that is the core of this problem. You know, I think we would never have had to create cloaked wireless if um, SMS-based 2FA or voice-based 2FA was abolished. If that was abolished today, you know, that with the exception of, of, I think, some of the privacy benefits, but the SIM swap problem would literally just disappear. But, but the reality is that our banks, our social media, um, so many of the technologies and platforms we use still rely on this, this outdated uh, form of, of two-factor authentication. We saw yeah, things like uh, the ESC even got SIM swapped uh, in the run-up to the announcement of the ETFs. Um, the uh, Twitter account for the SEC got uh, SIM swapped and uh, dropped the announcement early for someone to uh, capitalize on some trading. Yeah, I mean, it, it happens all the time. And I don't think people necessarily realize it. That is like how vulnerable you really are when you're just carrying around a phone, right? I mean, essentially, like right now, it's it's almost impossible to go through the day by day basis. Like we're connecting right now over the internet, right? I mean, we've connected through email, we've connected through DMs, like that kind of stuff. All really needs a smartphone unless you want to sit at the computer or do something else like that, you know, or connecting to a hotspot or do something else like that. So the reliance on getting onto, you know, whether it's social media or spreading information, people are listening to this probably on a smartphone. Right? I mean, everybody's kind of relying on that right now. And they yeah. have all the information stored in their pocket yeah. and people and just don't really realize it. So that's root. That is yeah, root. Your uh, Gmail account. Um, and the way you authenticate with Google probably comes down to an SMS uh, uh, at the end of the day. Uh, if you lose your um, account or your password, it will probably send an SMS to your device uh, that it has registered. That's the uh, likely root uh, of security for most phones. Same with um, Apple. 
And for yeah. maybe for like, if, if there's folks out there who don't know about SIM swap and SIM swap attacks, I can maybe just give a high level. Because so we always assume that I think, within, especially within our community, that that's, it's kind of a known attack. But if, if there's people out there that don't know what a SIM swap attack is, the the origin of the problem started when. Uh, companies started using SMS-based two-factor authentication. What that is when they send you a unique code by text to your phone, and they assume that if you have your phone, then you are authorized to reset a password on a platform. Uh, and and what happened when that when that took place is that the the security responsibilities of the platform were offloaded onto the phone company. And, and the phone company was never meant to be an authentication platform. The phone company was meant to be, you know, the, the, the company that gave you access to, to a wireless network. Right, and so because that that transfer responsibility took place, what happens now is that whether it's through bribery or someone coming into a store with a fake ID or or coercion uh, or even just social engineering, someone tricks an employee of the, your wireless company to swap your phone number onto a new SIM on a device that they control. And so from, from a user perspective, this is kind of what happens. You're sitting at home, you're, you know, going through TikTok, you're doing what you normally do, everything's normal. You leave your home and you disconnect with Wi-Fi and all of a sudden your phone doesn't work. I was like, why does my phone work? Why don't I have no connection? Now you realize, oh, I, I think I've been SIM swapped, right? And so now you call the co your, your phone company, but the damage is done because on the hacker side, what happened is the second they were successful at swapping that number over to that device, they have a team of people who are ready, ready and waiting. They're logging into your Facebook. They're going into your Gmail. They're contacting your family, telling your family that, hey, I'm in the bind. I need Bitcoin. I, you know, send it to this address. They're going out on all fronts all at once, changing passwords. And so, you know, it's, it's all of a sudden it's this panic where you've got to go and try and reset passwords, lock things off, get your SIM back from the phone company. And, and, and the results are devastating. Like there's, there's a, a, a fellow, Michael Turbin, who, who was infamously, I get $38 million uh, stolen from uh, as a result of, of, of a SIM swap attack. And so, you know, the, the results of these things are devastating. And, and again, I think where we really want to raise awareness is that it's that the, the lock's not broken. It's, it's, it's not there. Like it literally is not there. Uh, Princeton University did a study where they, they took um, 10 accounts from, from the big three um, and just using information online on the first call, just using social engineering, tried to SIM swap uh, each of the accounts. They were successful 100% of the time on the first call. So, so when, you, when, you, when you understand like the amount of things that are tied to this phone number and how easy it is for people to swap it, that was really what, what drove Jonathan and I to really focus on this as, as one of our first offerings uh, for, for Cloak Services. Yeah. And I mean, I don't think people like realize like how much of it, like you said, like a gateway this is to your own personal life. Right. I mean, before scammers had to come up to you and kind of try to fool you in person, you know, we didn't have everything so digital, but now they don't even have to leave their houses. They can just, like you said, social engineering, whether it's an email scam, sending you some fake PDF or something like that. Like it happens on a daily basis. Like millions of people are frauded and scammed every single day. You know, I mean, there's, you could just go search in like any payment rail company. It's seemingly PayPal scam, uh, even cash app, like some of these other ones, like Venmo, all, all these like big rails now are subjected to, to scam and have to be dealing with fraud. But the thing with Bitcoin is that it's a finalized payment, right? So, I mean, that's where you need to take some personal responsibility for this. So, you know, with avoiding these SIM swaps, right? I mean, because there is no company, there's no CEO of Bitcoin that you could call and be like, hey, you know, I just sent a million sats over to this person, you know, that I don't know. Can I get that? Yeah, the refund, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Can I get my refund? So, like, with Cloaked Wireless and what you guys are doing there, like, how is this going to help prevent, in a sense, right? You said, like there's not breaking the lock or, you know, like relocking it locks simply not there. So take us a dive uh, deep into the technology on like kind of how this, the intricacies of this works and uh, how we can avoid, you know, potentially getting scammed out of, out of some of our valuable sats here. Yeah. So it's, 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 that, um, happens is that a lot of the identifiers that someone would need to use to uh, attack you are very, very public. If you're using um, iMessage or something to, um, uh, uh, chat with someone, someone already knows that you have uh, uh, an iCloud account and they know the identifier and the phone number of the off SIM swap. Um, there are all these leaks out there that um, uh, have uh, dumped 
Um, you know, like at t recently had, uh, what was it, 38 million or uh, 70 million even accounts uh, uh, details released. And that's all the uh, um, hackers need to get into those accounts. Um, it's, you know, all the personal identifying information and then um, uh, if they can go through that list, figure out what uh, uh, some high value targets are, that's, the, 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 they made it very, very easy from there. Yeah, and when, and when we looked at the problem, I mean, really what, what we realized was that 100% of the SIM swaps are the result of someone other than the owner of the account modifying that account, period, right? And so when you look at it like that, the solution was obvious. It, it, the solution is that then only the owner of the account should be able to modify the account. Now, it sounds simple, and, and in, in effect, it, it kind of is simple, but here's the reason why it doesn't exist on the market today. And it's the same reason you were just saying about the CEO of Bitcoin not being able to issue a refund, is that there, there are not many wireless companies out there that are willing to tell a customer, I'm sorry, if you've lost your key, you've lost your number. We cannot help you. And, and that's basically what we've done. We've taken control of, of where we get our uh, wholesale feed of SMS, voice, and data, which just comes from wholesale from, our, from, our, uh, from the MNO that we, we purchase from. And then we control everything from there until the users you know, using the service on their, on their wireless. And so we control uh, all account modifications. We control what staff can and can't do. And we've locked it down so that the only person that can modify a wireless account is the owner of that account from their dashboard after they've authenticated themselves using proven open source authentication technologies, right? And we offer different levels based on whatever, you know, uh, technical level of comfort that the user has. But by locking it down and making it so that only the user can make those modifications, um, we've, we've effectively solved the problem of, of SIM swap attacks. Yeah, and I think at the end of the day too, right? I mean, you can only be so private in everybody's day, in this day and age, right? I mean, that, that's a big issue that Bitcoiners are seeing, right? It's like, all right, you know, if you had a Facebook account, if you had a, you know, Instagram, Twitter, even like all these different things, like there's so many ways to be manipulated, get attacked now because you just live online. So it's, it's making it so much easier. So, you know, with kind of, I guess, like, you know, almost like using cloak as like, a, I don't know, like a, a defense mechanism, right. To kind of, uh, you know, utilize that to, to help. Like, how do you guys see this? Uh, I guess this industry even as a whole, like kind of going forward, because I think right now, you know, like you said at the beginning is, is very few people kind of see this as an issue, but it's a growing one. And I think people are starting to wake up like, oh shit, my phone, like I got, you know, they lose their phone. They're like, basically their lifeline's dead. Like, you know. Yeah. That, yeah and I think you, you hit the nail on the head when you, when you talked about privacy, right? And, and Jonathan mentioned it before, 70 million user records uh, hacked and stolen from AT&T, right? And so I guess when you use Facebook or TikTok or Google, you expect your data to be monetized, right? You expect that you're the product, you're getting something for free, you understand that they're monetizing your use of that product. But we've, we've kind of assumed, and it's okay, that, that when we sign up for our wireless service, where, where the transaction is pretty clear, you know, we're paying for wireless access, you provide me with wireless access. But, but what's happening is these companies are hoarding your personal data, they're going out there selling it, monetizing it, finding ways to, to, to dig deeper and sell more. And, and so they're not just, they're, they're, they're monetizing your, your personal data in addition to selling you the wireless. And so, you know, for us, privacy is, is very important. You know, both Jonathan and I come from the Bitcoin community um, and, and, and kind of that, that cypherpunk ethos. And I think for us, the idea of, of enabling someone to come in and get quality 5G wireless without having to provide your name without having to go through a KYC with the ability to just come in and leave an email and, and pay with Bitcoin uh, was something that was, was really important for us when we, we created this offering, right? Because I think that, that is really the, um, the, the, the idea behind offering a private and secure wireless service is that it, it is both secure from SIM swap attacks, but also that you're able to use it privately and anonymously if that's what you want to do. Jonathan, do you have anything to add on, I guess, on the privacy aspect of things? No, I mean, uh, uh, there was a recent attack um, that came across uh, uh, Krebs uh, list, um, and it was talking about how people were using um, uh, that uh, iMessage uh, issue that I mentioned. 
Um, so there's not really much of a defense against that. Um, you know, you basically have to get a second SIM and uh, use that number solely as your authenticator and uh, for your interactions with, um, uh, with iCloud and Apple. Um, and that's something um, that, you know, it's an extra step, but it's, it's sort of the only thing you can do to, to lock that down. Um, having having a, a private uh, authenticator that you just use for those contacts is, um, is, is, is really the only defense. And to not have to have that be shared in any other context and, uh, is, is a, a large burden, but it's being forced on us by these, uh, uh, this haphazard sort of rush to um, use the uh, SMS and the phone as, as the only real identifier that uh, anyone has uh, with these companies. There are... Uh, are some things like um, uh, pass keys and so forth that Google's been pushing for a while. Apple's site has only recently adopted, um, but uh, um, that's sort of the end goal: is you want wind up with an authenticator that's essentially just a, a, a sorry a public key, and uh, use that. But um, we're we're still many many years from that being widely deployed and and uh, the standard. Are you looking for the number one place to find all the information you can about Bitcoin, whether it's price, whether it's hash rate, whether it's the latest up to date things outside of Bitcoin, whether it's nation state adoption, what have you? Well, I've got the place for you. Check out BitcoinNews.com. They've even got the number one newsletter in the game when it comes to Bitcoin because it gives you all the up to date information on every single thing that happened in the past week. That'll come to your inbox every single Monday morning. You can sign up using this code right down here or this link. It's also in the show notes. So come join me and thousands and thousands of other people that are getting the most up-to-date information from BitcoinNews.com and their newsletter. All right, let's get back to the show. Yeah, hundred percent. And I think you know, I, I got an. I guess I got another question here too, right? Because obviously, you know, iPhone. You know, you get it from the store. They kind of have like the SIM card almost essentially built in at this point. But something that's become very popular over the last few years, especially since COVID, has been like the digital nomad era, right? People moving around, being able to work from wherever, right? We're coming at this interview from three different places right now, right? So um, with all that being said, I know very many people who utilize, you know, different phones. And then when they go to a different country, they buy a SIM card from that specific country for, you know, a few months. Now, how much more does that matter? How much vulnerability does that leave you open to when you have, you know, kind of like multiple SIM cards going in and out and kind of like the growing age of, you know, not really knowing where you're at and all that kind of thing. Like, does that, you know, open you up to more potential liability as well? Like the more you're kind of traveling around and getting around people? Absolutely. I mean, if you have, uh, if you've gone and used a burner phone uh, or burner number for um, setting up your iCloud, for instance, and you forget to remove that from your account entirely, uh, someone else might get that number allocated to them just uh, naturally. Um, the, the, company, the organizations that have these, uh, these like, you know, uh, single use um, SMS and or you know short term use SMS um, will have a pool of uh, phone numbers and they'll be cycling them th uh, through so they'll be handed out to someone else next week um, and that's not a situation you want to wind up in uh, you know odds are it's not going to be someone who's uh, trying to attack you but they'll wind up uh, with access to a lot of your other uh, systems um, especially since they you know so many of the financial services apps. Uh, are predicated on just an SMS to that number to uh, restore access and uh, give you access to the funds. So having something that you're able to uh, lock down long term is, is sort of critical to safety online. Yeah, I think that's kind of the key is, is that, you know, as, as, as smartphones start allowing, you know, you, you can store multiple eSIMs in your in your phone now and, and activate, you know, two, sometimes three SIMs uh, active at one time. I think what's, what's important is that you always have one that is secure, whether it's your primary or whether it's a secondary one, but one that you know is secure that you can constantly use for any type of online uh, ask for your phone number. Um, you know, by, by doing that, it's it, you're, you're, you're keeping good security hygiene, at least when it comes to uh, your online authentication. And you can cycle the data only SIMs as, well, as often as you want, um, but you do need that single identifier at least. Yeah, now, yeah. go ahead, Jeremy. 
Oh, sorry. Yeah, I was going to say, like, at, at an absolute minimum, people should, you know, check their social media platforms, make sure that they've uh, uh, enacted, you know, a, a different type of two-factor authentication other than just SMS. Um, I, I think a lot of people would be surprised when they when they start double-clicking on their bank and their uh, Facebook accounts to, to understand how many of these things are actually still relying on SMS-based uh, two-factor authentication for password resets. In the past couple of years, people have really started to, some of this, um, these sites have started pushing um, uh, the U2F, which then became called uh, Passkey. And that uh, is really starting to mature now. So if you have a YubiKey or, or what have you, um, uh, or now the phone itself is uh, supporting this, um, that's a really great way to upgrade your security in a massive, uh, in a massive way. Yeah. yeah. 100%. Yeah. I mean, uh, you guys are just like listing all these like potential attacks. And I'm just sitting here thinking like, all right, I'm, I'm on Google Chrome doing all this. Google has passwords to a lot of various things, right? They have the password manager. So somebody just gets my password to my email. You yeah. know, oh, shit, here we go. Uh, off to the races for, for a scammer. So, yeah. I mean, I definitely, yeah. you know, I, I empathize with people who have that potential problem. But, you know, from, from your current customers that you guys have had or like people that, you know, have, have seen the need for this problem, you know, uh, what are like, I guess, some additional measures they're using to help, uh, you know, I guess, like, kind of avoid some of these potential attacks, right? I mean, obviously, SIM swap's a big issue too, right? But there's the two-factor authentication that essentially happens in, almost all their passwords. Is that just yeah. kind of the, the magic sauce here, right? Like That, that is, what, that, that's, that is what everyone's sort of done. Um, there was no real, uh, you know, industry-wide analysis of whether this was a good idea or not. Um, it was just, you know, if you're a free hosting provider you're, or you're providing some free service, um, how are you going to authenticate that someone is who they are when, you know, someone might have had to uh, uh, use their work email and now they're no longer at that job? Uh, so how do you authenticate them? Uh, well, the only thing that, that was reliable, uh, widespread, and um, uh, didn't cost them a lot more money to be able to uh, do was to send, like, tri uh, get this person's uh, phone number and send them some sort of message. Either, um, you know, f phone them and speak a uh, number or send it a text if it's, uh, uh, if it's in the case of at the mobile. Um, and that really just sort of pushed the problem to someone else who wasn't actually intending to have that problem uh, be their responsibility. You know, telcos didn't ask for this. Um, but in practice, tech companies were noticed that the only long-term reliable uh, identifier or, you know, contact method was the phone number. People will, you know, move across the country and because of cell phone number portability, they'll keep the number. Um, and, uh, you know, once you've got a certain number of people have your, that phone number, you don't want to give it up. So um, that works great for a lot of people. For, for a lot of people, uh, it doesn't work at all. You know, if you, um, uh, let's say you uh, lose your job uh, and, and move across the country, you might not have bothered keeping that number. Uh, and to have the answer be you're just now completely screwed is um, not really palatable, but it's what the tech companies have been saying to their customers for years. Sorry. And what's important, yeah, what's unfortunate is that it's matured from, from there, right? Like the, there has, a, a, like better technology exists today. When 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 you sign up and and authenticate yourself to, to access your wireless account, we we have three options, right? You can use uh, TOTP, which is your Google Authenticator. Um, you you can use a UB key, like Jonathan was saying, the the U2F technology, or even like Lightning on, right? And so if you think about your uh, having access to a Lightning wallet and you're able to just scan a QR code and and uh, authenticate yourself in the same way that you you know. Uh, signing a, 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 a message using your your, your um, Bitcoin key, you know, these types of authentications are so much more superior to the, the SMS-based or voice-based authentication that's been used in the past. And yet, you know, the predominant way of uh, resetting passwords for, for most platforms today remains SMS-based two-factor authentication. Right. And even uh, the YubiKey system uh, is inferior to what we have in, in the Bitcoin space. You know, one of the things that I... Um, was drawn to Bitcoin in the first place before was it actually presented uh, solutions to a lot of fundamental security problems. Like um, key management has never really been uh, handled well 
uh, in cryptography, et cetera, in the, in the um, security space. You know, people had PGP keys, et cetera. But what did you do to back it up? Put it on uh, a flash drive, put it on um, uh, what have you. There were a couple um, paper-based um, systems, but nothing like we have with um, the uh, Bitcoin, um, you know, the metal plates that you can have uh, your mnemonic stamped on. That's a good long-term strategy. It'll survive fires, it'll survive floods, it'll survive pretty much anything if you uh, uh, can keep your hands on it. And you can have a couple of copies of that uh, made and, and stored in multiple safe places. That's the long-term identity protection uh, plan. Um, uh, having a couple of YubiKeys is important. If you just have one, uh, they break. Uh, they are pretty durable, uh, surprisingly so, but they will break if you have uh, just, you know, you throw uh, one of the small UBC, uh, YubiKey C ones uh, inside of your laptop and you just leave it. Sometimes you're going to bump that and it, the internal traces are going to break. Mm. Uh, so having multiple of those, if you choose that as your authentication mechanism, is critical. Yeah, and I mean, like it, like we've been kind of going over here, right? I mean, like Bitcoiners have kind of gotten to the point where they're they're able to to read through the scams in person, right? Read through the the shit coinery that goes on. Read through like you know Ethereum. Read through some of these other you know alt meme coins, whatever it is. Um, but you know, we're not all protecting our bases when it comes to the potential of SIM swaps. So I think you guys have like kind of nailed it on the head and really are solving a problem that, you know, many of us are not really thinking about, especially, you know, as we're trying to grow and develop the adoption here, especially when it comes to, you know, in-person transactions, like spending on the Lightning Network and going to spend some sats, like that opens you up to a lot of liability by having some some sats on your phone, even like in, in cold storage in a sense, right? I mean, if you have any sort of, uh, data stored on your phone, whether it's your private keys and a notes app or whatever, you probably shouldn't be doing that in general, right? I mean, you should probably Definitely have it not. on some sort of uh, hard hard plate like you guys described here already. Um, but you brought up FTX, right? I mean, that, that's what happened there. There's a potential, uh, you know, I guess, uh, what is it? A, a custodian, right? I mean, there's every, everything kind of has that. So, you know, when it, when it comes to you know, these potential big exchanges, whether it's, you know, the spot ETFs that we have coming on in the United States or other things like that, you know, people think that they're protected there, right? But it's not necessarily the case, right? So is that kind of a, are you guys kind of like yeah. noticing that as well, where it's like, you're kind of, a, you know, whether they're, they're Bitcoiners or whatnot, they're, if they're buying it and holding it on a, a, you know, on an exchange or buying this ETF and they're thinking, hey, you know, I got it in my Charles Schwab account or I got it in Coinbase or Binance or one of these things like it should be fine that, you know, it's still kind of like a I guess almost like a missing uh, barrier that people don't realize like, all right, it's not just like they can take my private keys. It's like they could take all my passwords to everything. Yeah. yeah. Store then, in, uh, iCloud or with Google, uh, um, those passwords are exposed uh, on the basis of probably an SMS reset. Um, self -custody. Yeah, good. When you when you talk about the threat to Bitcoiners, you know, I think what's really important is, yeah, that there is that individual side where individuals need to kind of be aware of, of their vulnerability and has nothing to do with their ability to, to you know, detect a, a scam. It, it, it's something that happens behind the scenes that you're a victim and then you're a victim, you know, unless you're protecting yourself. But then there's the, the corporate side, right? Uh, and so when you look at FTX, you look at um, a lot of these these uh, uh, shit coins that, that got taken out or got, got stolen so didn't, work, didn't have good hygiene. A lot of these are taking place with, through SIM swap attacks, right? And, and it's not just within the crypto or Bitcoin community, but it's, it's, it's across um, cor corporate America, or, you know? So, so if you've got an InfoSec team or a network operations team and, and one of them is compromised, all of a sudden, not only is their data at risk, but the, your your corporate data is now at risk. Your customers' data is now at risk, and so you know a, a lot of these attack vectors aren't just about going and draining the bank accounts of, of individuals. It's also about going in and uh, you know stealing data from corporations uh, and, and causing irreparable damage to, to companies um, who, who are vulnerable. So so we're we're seeing a lot of um, uptake and interest is within you know Bitcoin companies and and CISOs who are coming over and saying, hey, we need to talk to you about getting our teams set up with secure um, SIMs in order to close that vulnerability that, that they realize is, is, is massive and, and potentially a threat to the business. Like your GoDaddy account at some point, one of the authenticators they can use to uh, uh, reset an account is a phone number. 
so imagine your website is now in the hands of, of a sim swap attack, uh, a hacker, you know, and, and doing whatever they want unless you send X amount of Bitcoin to, to their address. Are you looking for the number one place where you can connect with Bitcoiners, where you can find merchants that are accepting Bitcoin, where you can even find information about your local meetup? Well, I've got the place for you. That's the Orange Pill app. You can sign up directly below at my referral link right there, and I will give you 10,000 sats off your purchase. And you can even connect with me. Tell me how you like the episode. Heckle me a little bit. Tell me I look funny on camera. Do the whole nine, and I will see you on the Orange Pill app. All right, now back to the show. I know it's just it opens you up for, for liability, the potential of blackmail, and 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 much more, right? So it's interesting, right? You know, because you normally we, we talk about the attacks on Bitcoin itself here, right? But there's also the human element too. I mean, I always think of like, uh, you know, I, I've seen so I I'm, I'm big into like the the drug documentaries and that kind of thing. So I always think of like people fooling the the drug dog owner or the uh, the cops, not necessarily the the dog, right? So they'll see, you know, and are some crazy things there. Well, they'll put like you know the drugs underneath like some ground beef, right? So the dog starts barking at this ground beef because there's drugs underneath it where the uh you know the cop just thinks the dog's just going for meat or something like that right so it's not necessarily like the dog's doing anything wrong it's it's the step there right so i think like this is just perfect to kind of protect users or anything else like that but you know and we got the the most protected network and and blockchain that there is in, in the bitcoin network as well so i think this this message should definitely reson resonate across that but let's let's get into the juicy stuff boys like how, how are we feeling here i mean we're, we're sitting at bitcoin like right around 70k right now with everything still going and uh and pumping so how are you guys feeling about the overall bitcoin market and like you know kind of embracing yourselves into into this bitcoin ecosystem with with cloak wireless as well yeah, I can I can jump in. I mean, for, I think what's what's cool is when you go back, right? Like, go go way back, right? And and it was just a couple of you know nerds, but you know, cipher punking it out and talking hardcore cryptography in, in these in these rooms on the internet, and and then you know all of a sudden they started to have conferences, tiny conferences, right, with like ten guys in a hotel in New York, and then the conferences got bigger, and then there were travel agencies. And then there were like Bitcoin cruises and Bitcoin resorts and then El Salvador, right? And and now there's a, a Bitcoin wireless company, right? Made by Bitcoiners for Bitcoiners to solve a problem that, that our community suffered from for a long time. And you know, the fact that that we were able to kind of navigate the FCC uh, process and, and, and launch uh, uh, last month and and you know coming up to the happening and and uh, uh, and you know all time highs everything I mean it's just a it's a it's kind of a a, a perfect storm and we're we're super stoked to be able to, to to have this offering now as we you know go into the next uh, bull bull run and, and, and bull cycle like I'm uh, I, I'm not sure I'd, I'd buy into the the hundred k before the having but uh, I, I would be uh, ast astonished if it didn't happen uh, within a month or two afterwards. Yeah, we've never been at uh, uh, a all new all-time high before the happening, uh, and that's just going to uh, blow up this time. I'm, I'm really excited for it. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, we knew go ahead there, Jeremy. Oh, sorry, I was going to say that Jonathan and I uh, started uh, Cloak Services, which is the parent company of Cloak Wireless, about two years ago. And uh, J Jonathan uh, used to work at uh, Blockstream as, as the, the founding CSO there, uh, and then and then River Financial after that. But Jonathan and I actually worked together like in 2000, so God, we're, we're all 20, 24 years ago, um, at a company called Zero Knowledge Systems. Um, and we worked with uh, Adam Back, who was working there at the time, um, and we were building uh, something called the Freedom Network. It was a precursor to Tor. And... Uh, it didn't end up working. Tor ended up kind of taking off as, as a privacy network. Um, but one of the things that we've, we've been really passionate about since those days is building private and secure ways to, for people to access the internet and, and, and connect with each other. And so that that certainly influenced, you know, Cloak Wireless and starting Cloak Wireless, but it also influenced uh, the Cloak Network, which is another uh, product that we're building right now. Um, and, and, you know, when, when, when the Snowden Affair came out, one of the big revelations was that Tor had been compromised. Um, 
any nation state or anyone with enough visibility on the network could ultimately de-anonymize uh, users, uh, select users, right? And so um, because of that and a whole bunch of other reasons, we really wanted to solve that problem and, and, and create uh, a better alternative to, to, to Tor um, and, and not just enable, to enable people to, to access the internet privately, and, but, but also because like more than 60% of Bitcoin nodes are hosted on top of Tor. Right, so you've got you've got a massive part of Bitcoin's infrastructure that's relying on this this network that is slowly, fa uh, you know, failing and, and decaying. Um, so it was kind of the, the combination of those things that really drove us to to look at how, you know how do we solve this? How do we replace Tor with something that that is truly private, truly anonymous, um, and properly incentivized so it doesn't suffer the same issues that the Tor net network uh, is suffering on? So that's another uh, big project that we've been working on. Right. Um, and, and more importantly, um, you know, we can solve certain problems with the with the, uh, cloaked wireless as is, but um, th some things, some privacy attacks, we can't yet solve at the level we are at. Um, you, uh, the network, um, the cellular networks have a fundamental uh, location uh, tracking problem that's inherent to the radios they use, right? Um, solving that is not something that you can do with a. Um, uh, at, at that level uh, by putting in a new SIM or putting in a new um, uh, or running a VPN. Um, what happens is the there are certain um, uh, things that are tracked on the network level. Uh, NetFlow data is resold and, um, uh, and correlated. So if you're running through a VPN, it's uh, trivial to correlate your in amount and outbound traffic and uh, de-anonymize you. Um, if you're having to uh, have the cellular network um, uh, route your traffic, you're going to have them able to identify your unique location in uh, meet space. You know, they're going to know exactly where you are. Um, and uh, just the uh, signal strength to various um, transmitters and receivers tells you uh, uh, where you are. So we wanted to be able to eventually solve that. And uh, one of the ways we get there is by building out a uh, a large scale network of uh, nodes that are able to route your traffic and reroute your traffic. So down the road, we'd like to be able to um, uh, have all the network traffic uh, used as a uh, cloaked wireless subscriber go over that network as well. Um, so that's sort of the uh, end game. And then uh, down the road, have something where um, uh, operators are able to have a hosted um, like 5G uh, uh, microcell, uh, and then route uh, any wireless traffic that's uh, in that vicinity through the network. Yeah, Jeremy, you said something interesting there, where sixty percent of Bitcoin nodes are, you know, run on Tor, which is a decaying network at this point. So, you know, is this? I, I know we talk about the fifty percent attack, right? With uh, with Bitcoin miners, like, is this another potential attack vector? Right. We, we saw a huge problem last, uh, I guess, about a year and a half ago now. Um, Tor was under a massive DDoS, and we saw people having their uh, Lightning channels closed en masse. And um, if it wasn't a direct attack on the Lightning network, yeah. it was an effective attack on it. Um, because in addition to um, the uh, routes being closed, they were being closed at a time when um, uh, uh, fees were very high. So they were being closed at sort of maximal cost as well. So people were getting essentially, you know, uh, much reduced uh, value out of that or no value out of the, the, the uh, channels that they had established. Yeah, and, and when, when, you, when, you know, when, I, when I make a statement like Tor is failing, right, and, and I think that the, the, the reasons why I say that is that, A, I don't think it's properly incentivized. So, so for people who don't know, Tor is basically you're, you're jumping from node to node uh, to node and then exiting the network to where you're going. And by jumping from those, you know, one to the other, the idea is that you're anonymizing yourself and the people that host those nodes do it out of the goodness of their heart. Um, and, and, you know, some places take on certain liabilities by, by hosting uh, a node and, and, and handling that traffic um, because they're handling the traffic of someone else that's browsing through their node. Um, and so as a result of them not being properly incentivized, there's not, enough Tor nodes out there. And because the Tor network hasn't really upgraded how they anonymize their data or, or you know, it's first in, first out, because of these reasons, all of a sudden it's, it's, it's not even anonymous anymore. And so when, when we look to solve it, uh, we really wanted to address, A, we need to properly incentivize it. 
B, it needs to be truly anonymous. So we need to use mixed net technology. We need to have a, a form of, of, if there's payments, the payments need to be done anonymously. Um, and and we, you know, we, we need to solve the problem better than the VPN industry does today or Tor does today. Um, and, and what we've created, we believe kind of checks all those boxes, right? And in the, in the simplest form, the way it works is that you would have a client, right? Which is think of it as a VPN client. You could choose to use it for free and that means that you're limited to people hosting nodes that are free. And there will be people out of the goodness of their hearts that do that, in which case, you know, you may have to wait a little bit longer because those will be busy. Or you can throw three bucks uh, worth of Bitcoin onto your client, right? And your client immediately exchanges that with a, a show me and mint. So I don't know if you've heard, heard some of the stuff that Cali BTC is doing with Cashew and, and, and show me and mint, but you're basically exchanging a Satoshi for a cloaked wireless Satoshi uh, or a cloaked SAT. Right, and now you have this anonymous uh, thing that's worth the same as a Satoshi, and you can just say, "Hey, I'm, you know, I, I want to set my price to about three bucks a month." And now you'll make micro payments with these node operators who have also said, "Hey, I'm happy to, to take your data, anonymize it, and send it along its way for you know ten sats, uh, you know, or whatever that is." And so all of a sudden, you know, you're exchanging these anonymous tokens with them. They're anonymizing your data and passing it along, and and you've got everyone who's properly incentivized and getting you know, truly anonymous access to the internet. You know, imagine a VPN service where it, it doesn't say, oh, I recognize you as a VPN, right? Which happens that, you know, all these, it isn't centralized. There is no one in control. It's open source. Um, and, and for us, that solves the problem. And then you look at like an $8 billion global VPN market. Like if you're going to pay five bucks a month to Surfshark, or you're going to pay three bucks a month for a solution that completely works, it's open source, uh, and and performs way better than you know the private one you're using now. So you can you can shift that that industry over to this network, and all of a sudden, anyone with an unlimited um, internet connection at home and a laptop that they don't mind running a node on can make a couple extra hundred bucks a month by reselling their unlimited internet and anonymizing people's people's traffic. All right, we'll give you a quick commercial break here to bring you the Bitcoin Advisor. That's right, the Bitcoin Advisor can help you make large purchases of Bitcoin, collaborative custody model to help you get your Bitcoin off an exchange and securely store it. So none of these things, you see Coinbase going down, you see all these places potentially running out of Bitcoin. We gotta hurry up and get that shit off an exchange. So go visit me at content.thebitcoinadvisor.com backslash green candle and you can set a meeting with me that's right, me, Brandon from Green Candle, and I can help you out and get everything set up. And if you decide to set up with us, if you come through me, I'll give you that first month free. So go ahead, set up that meeting, and we can help you out. All right, now back to the show. Well, too, and like people have like a misnomer about VPNs, I think, right? I mean, like NordVPN was like, is like one of the more major ones, and in 2019 they had a huge data breach, right? I mean, like you know, a lot of these. Mm -hmm that are like you know preaching security just at the end of the day they have their own attacks as well um but uh you know i want to go take a step back to you about like you two guys right i mean you 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 mentioned that you've been working together for over 20 years now not to date you too much but um you know you guys have been working and then you worked with adam back so tell us a little bit about the orange pill story how did you guys find this magic internet money was it kind of having to deal with like you know, I guess the security aspect of it, where it was that kind of the bug that struck you guys or, um, yeah, tell us. That's what bit. did it for me. Um, you know, I've been uh, working in computer security from uh, since about 1996. I joined a company that built one of the first uh, vulnerability scanners. And, um, you know, so uh, we, that product was essentially, a, 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 you know, a hacker in a box that would uh, go out on a network, find all the vulnerabilities and, and you actually try to exploit them. Um, uh, and so I've been mean, working in that space for a long time and um, the problems inherent there are uh, haven't really had any real new uh, thinking around how you solve them. A lot of the problems are core um, uh, issues with how you are going to convince someone that they have to uh, have some sort of uh, private key that they protect properly and um, you know when um, I encountered Bitcoin I was like this uh, is interesting, but moreover, if we can get people to adopt this, this solves so many problems. You know, if you have a, a, a wallet uh, with a private key that has actual value, you will protect it. You're not going to leave your Yubi key um, on your key on your uh, on your keys and just leave it on your desk when you go out for lunch. 
um, you know, if you, it's, if it's your wallet, uh, you're going to bring it with you because it's important. Um, and that can be a long-term identifier that is actually, uh, you know, cryptographically secure. And that solves a lot of problems in, um, uh, in computer security, just having people actually care about the thing that, um, uh, they're carrying around as an identifier because it actually has, um, uh, uh, financial value to them uh, is most of the uh, problem solved, and just seeing how um, you know Bitcoin has addressed things like long-term uh, key security with um, uh, you know the mnemonic system, that is a practical and effective way to uh, protect yourself. Um, there's a bunch of things to even prove that, like the the, the key XOR stuff that uh, has been introduced. But um, you know the fundamental technology is now actually uh, something that you can not just have hand wave about. Uh, for a long time, a lot of the uh, solutions that people were proposing in the security space were very hand wavy. They were like, well, you could do, we just do this. Um, uh, you just, you know, make a lot of copies of it and you don't ever have them, ha anything bad happen to them, which isn't a solution. Yeah, 100%. All right, Jeremy, tell us your <laughs> story, man. What resonated yeah. with you? So um, when I when I first got into it, so my, my brother was um, uh, the founding CEO at Blockstream with, with Adam Austin Hill, um, and he had their the first Blockstream offsite. Um, uh, I, I uh, was invited uh, and was I was hanging out. He was with uh, Blue Matt, and and I remember at the time talking to him and I was saying. And I distinctly remember this. I was sitting there going, "Man, I just I, I don't get Bitcoin at two hundred and thirty bucks." It's 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 not sustainable. It doesn't it doesn't make sense. Um, and him, he, it's okay. Like even you know the, there's there's you know satoshis and you know you, even even if there's not many bitcoin left, it, it can sustain. And him explaining that, and it still took years before you know I, I came to the realizations that I that I ultimately you know realized about bitcoin and, and, and understanding its uniqueness. Um, but but I was uh, I was definitely blessed with with. Uh, 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 having an amazing uh, orange pill experience with with some uh, this is some pretty awesome core devs. So yeah, very lucky. Yeah, that's a, that's some insane stuff that you guys have been just like working on this privacy aspect of things for for such a long time and kind of tied it into Bitcoin. So uh, before I let you guys both go here, uh, I want to I want to get you guys a prediction as to not necessarily like a price or anything like that, but you know, kind of how you guys see the rest of this year going for any potential like big failures. Do you guys see anything? I mean, like obviously you see the SIM swap things where it's like on a personal level, but do you see any other like kind of potential attacks maybe coming to light here about Bitcoin that you guys are a little bit worried about here going forward? Uh, I'll say this. I've been less so worried about things than, than anyone before. Um, you know, last cycle we had uh, all kinds of uh, very, very scammy uh, exchanges cropping up and uh, obviously that just went uh, very poorly um, and, you know a lot of people were farming out trust to uh, people hyping you know and saying yields that you know were unsustainable there was a lot of a lot of noise and churn in the market you know it's done it seems like we've finally gotten to a point where there's a lot more maturity around everything um, you know the SEC's finally uh, uh, Done the same thing and uh, allowed the spot uh, ETFs to, to come forward, um, and uh, uh, it's actually looking like a fairly respectable and responsible uh, system. Uh, I'm sure there's going to be we're going to find out that uh, maybe one of those uh, ETFs has been doing something sketchy with their uh, custodianship, um, but it's 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 going to be a lot less of a uh, uh, an issue because the market's so much bigger now. Um, uh, you know, it's, it's much better distributed than it's ever been. And, um, uh, you know, Bitcoin is the only real decentralized network there is. And uh, people are finally realizing this. And, um, you know, money is, is going there. It's, it's, uh, it's, it's going to where the value is. Yeah, I, I don't think, I think of it as, as much of a threat. But I think the trend that we're going to see this year is um, shit coins on Bitcoin. And, and, you know, I think one of the reasons the altcoins blew up was because everyone was impatient for a certain functionality that wasn't available on Bitcoin at the time. And now that that functionality is, is more readily there, 
I think we're going to see a whole bunch of these alts, um, you know, who have failed miserably and there's just been scams over on Ethereum. They're going to be legitimized or feel that they're legitimized by by doing the same shitcoin on, on Bitcoin. Um, and I think, you know, there's this recent, you know, all, all this controversy with, with, with Bitcoin magazine and them taking money from, you know, this, this uh, with clearly a scam, you know, built on Bitcoin. Um, I, I, th I think this is a trend that we're going to see more and more of. Um, I, I don't necessarily see it as a thread, but I just think it's it's the the natural evolution to what will eventually be the death of, of the altcoin market. Um, but I think this is one of their death thralls is going to be trying to legitimize themselves by building on top of Bitcoin. A hundred percent. And uh, yeah, I mean, I could definitely see all that that going on as well. But Jeremy, Jonathan, you guys have been very generous with your time. So I appreciate you coming on the podcast. Why don't you tell everybody where they could figure out more about Cloak, uh, Cloak Wireless and what you guys are doing? Yeah, they can go to uh, cloakwireless.com and check out plans. Um, we created a, a special discount code for the show. So if you put in uh, uh, GC2024, you'll get 25% uh, off your, your first month. Um, and, and yeah, if, you, if you've got questions or you're just interested about the problem or, or want to learn more, like feel free to reach out. Our contact info is on the website and uh, we get back to people pretty quickly. Yeah, 100 percent. And I'll put all that in the show notes. And yeah, we got the discount code for the first month. So that's GC2024. Be sure to use it. And uh, yeah, protect yourself from these SIM swaps, man. I mean, it's not just uh, an attack on Bitcoin. It's an attack on the Bitcoiners. So um, yeah, thank you guys so much for, for coming on the show. And uh, thanks for having us. That, uh, that, yeah. that uh, many aren't, aren't really thinking about. Yeah, thanks for having us, man. Thanks so much for tuning in to this great episode. If you enjoyed this one and you want some more content, click on the link right here and check out my latest interview with Tom Luanga. We get into it all. If you've known Tom, he's a wild one, so stay tuned. And if you found some value in this podcast, please smash that like button. Hit that subscribe button so you get notified of the next videos. All right, I'll catch you at the next one.